<laughs> Keith had just moved to Greencroft from Ames, Iowa. And since Janet and I had moved about six months earlier from central Iowa, we discovered that we had many common acquaintances. We were surprised that we had never met in Iowa, but that we had probably bumped into each other at the crowded Harold Wells Memorial Gathering at the Thoreau Center. I had started to attend the weekly Sam Hedron meetings and thought that Ken, uh, Keith would be an interesting addition. However, I didn't know what the Sam Hedron's policies and procedures were for inviting new participants. So I told a seemingly established Sam Hedron how I met Keith and whether or not I should invite him to our Tuesday gatherings. He said, we all know Keith, invite him. So for you who don't know Keith, here's a brief summary. Keith was born in Canada and moved with his family to New York when he was seven. In 1956, he enrolled with his parents at Goshen College. After graduating, he taught at Bethany Christian High School and other area schools for four years. He married Rhoda Nafsinger in 1962. They had three children, all who studied at Goshen College. Keith graduated from uh, Goshen Biblical Seminary in 1966 and pastored at churches in South Texas, Wichita, Kansas, and Des Moines, Iowa, before starting the Ames Mennonite Church. Since the AIM ministry was only part-time, Keith took graduate courses to be a marriage and family therapist. He served as such from 1981 to 2013. After years of struggling with his sexual identity, Keith came out as gay in 1987. The Central District terminated his ministerial credentials and he and Rhoda divorced. In June 2023, Central District Mennonite Conference at its annual me meeting held here at College Mennonite Church restored Keith's credentials. Keith has gone back and forth as to what his opening remarks to you should be. I trust you will fill any gaps during the questions and answers period. And uh, during that period, unless you and Keith know each other, please state your name and the years you attended or worked at Goshen College. Um, please join me in welcoming Keith to Sojourners. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's a, a joy to be here. I've looked forward to this for some time, and uh, I've gone over many uh, renditions or editions of, of what I might say, and uh, I don't expect I'll use any of them at the moment, um, just because it looks like I might see you, and because I have glasses doesn't mean that I either see you or recognize you. So don't assume uh, a couple of us have talked already and, and made uh, connections and, and renewed contact from long ago. But uh, to begin with, I want to uh, share appreciation to uh, bo uh, both Vic Stoltzfus and, and Mark for uh, welcoming me and uh, giving me the opportunity to, to share today. Uh, and. I think before I go on, I'd like to pause for a, a, a moment. I've, I've learned in my experience, especially the last few years, to, to pause to get a sense of, of presence and inner readiness to, to be here. And uh, because this is a transition in many ways from the service and from the fellowship time, I would appreciate and invite you, if you're interested, in joining me in a moment of silence. <laughs>
Thank you. I'd like to begin my remarks with gratitude for so many people that have been part of this journey over the past 70 plus years. Uh, includes family, my parents who passed, you know, Gordon and Laura Schrag, some of you knew them when they lived here, um, and they were uh, total affirming allies in, in every step, step of the journey. And in the spiritual world, uh, I've been aware of their presence and affirmation in the decades since. There are many people within Mennonite Church, beyond, uh, in, in various aspects of the journey that have been very strong allies. There have been uh, leaders in the church that have been allies. Now, they're former leaders who, who are the opposite as well and who uh, who added to some of the, the pain and anguish that, that became essential steps of the journey. But uh, I found allies and helpers in so many unexpected places and ways and want to give credit to. It's way too many uh, groups to name, but some of you are aware of some of the para-church organizations. The BMC, Brother Mennonite Council, it used to be for uh, GLBT concerns. Uh, now it's interests, um, Pink Menno, Menno Neighbors, um, various other groups that uh, over the, the course, especially during the desert years, were very uh, helpful. From my earliest days, uh, will you give me a, a signal uh, at 20 minutes, please? Thank you. Uh, I sometimes get carried away. <laughs> what I'm planning to do is, is to give a few snippets here and there on, on three different aspects of the journey. One is my personal journey, personal and family. The second one is the Ames Mennonite Congregation Fellowship Church. And then the third is the whole area of transformation. And since MCUSA passed the resolution on uh, repentance and transformation, um, the journey on exploring what that means and the options that that gives uh, for now and into the future. I don't know when the earliest day was that I remember being more attracted, um, basically energetically attracted to males than females. But I do remember a couple of early incidents. One was one early or mid-June day in Lowellville Academy in northern New York um, in sixth grade when um, Donnie came to school. Donnie's father was the Episcopal pastor, um, and Donnie came to school in shorts. It was just down to the knees. I had never seen a, a male student in school uh, in, in shorts before, even on the hottest days, and there were some really hot days in, in June, even in northern New York State. I had no clue what that meant. But I was to find out in the years following that, that I couldn't take any credit for behaving myself as a good Christian man and a young boy relative to girls. I had no clue what that meant, as I say. Nor did I have a clue what it meant that I found some strong inner energy that wouldn't be satisfied in attraction to certain young men. And I've been exploring that mystery in the decades since. It goes into a lot of, of deep arenas. It deals with sexuality. It deals with uh, understanding my body and accepting my body as a gift of God. It, it means a, a lot in terms of who I relate to, on what level, uh, and even today. Back then, as a oldest son of a minister, grandson of a Mennonite minister, um, my interest, my need was to be a good boy for Jesus, to serve Jesus, and to reflect what it was, what it meant to, to be a responsible human being. 
when there were issues that came to me that I didn't know how to deal with, I didn't know with whom it would be okay to share. I knew that there were times that the, the feelings that I had, the intense attractions, I could not talk with anybody about. I've become aware since that legally I was in deep trouble. Um, back then, Senator McCarthy was, uh, was doing war on the, the commies and the homos. And e each of us was uh, of uh, imminent danger to the, the well-being of the United States. I knew that psychologically speaking, I was sick. And of course, in terms of Christian faith, I, I was, uh, maybe a nice word would be a heretic. Um, so there was no way that I could accept who I was at that point. It took so much energy to try to hide that, that at times I'm sure that I was only partially present uh, in life and in life's activities. And I'm so grateful and amazed that there are people who knew me then and still somehow had the grace to accept me. One of those was my wife, who I met here at Goshen College my senior year in 19, late, uh, mid 19, mid uh, semester of 1959, 60. Uh, and we, after we married in 62, we had 25 years of working together, living together as parents, as teachers, as uh, leaders in the congregation. And uh, Rhoda worked very hard to uh, learn to accept who I was and, and do what she could to uh, be supportive. Some of you may uh, have worked with her when she was doing her uh, interim work when she was in seminary, she worked here at College Mennonite, uh, at her internship. Uh, and then uh, by that time, she had moved here and had served with MCC. Uh, in, in various stages, uh, I came out to her, the first time being um, during seminary, my senior year, she was pregnant with our first son, Jonathan. Some of you know Jonathan. He's the reason for my moving back here. Um, and uh, I was uh, kind of an interim uh, or student pastor. I was uh, a se seminary student at the time. Uh, and I was working with uh, Wallace Lakeside Chapel. Uh, and one night, I, during the middle of the night, I woke up in a, in a deep panic and uh, had an, an attack that I didn't have the resources for dealing with. Uh, so in the morning, we made an emergency trip to Oaklawn. And on the way back, I gave her a bit of information about some of the struggles that I had been going on, uh, had been going through, that were supposed to uh, all be gone once I got married. That was the common knowledge back then. And uh, it didn't work. Uh, so again, you know, the devastation was something I didn't know what to do with or who to go to. Um, there came a time when uh, serving the church, well, first I want to talk about the, the call to serve the church. Um, I remember days uh, here when, when people like uh, J.C. Wanger and uh, S.C. Yoder, who were people that I had known before coming to Goshen, uh, were uh, very, very important to me in terms of my growth and development. But the call to minister came uh, in uh, th there were lecture series that were going on in the early 60s. And H.S. Bender did a series on, that was published then in the book, These Are My People. And I had an inner sense that my presence in this lifetime was to be part of a congregation that was really committed. It, it was an idealistic sense of, of who the people of God are, but it spoke deeply to me. And within a year or two, Paul Miller did a series on uh, Servant of God's Servants. Uh, and I felt then uh, that that was who I am and what I'm, call, what I'm called to be and do. So there was this deep resonance with the, with the church and being part of the church and inner knowing that that's who I was to be. But my sexuality, my, my sexual orientation was something that the church couldn't help me with. Uh, 
during uh, during that time, uh, when my when the children were in high school, Rhoda and I decided it was time to come out to them, and uh, they spent some time. Um, at at that point, divorce wasn't in the picture yet, and their acceptance of me was surprisingly uh, positive. The difficulty came when I divorced, and they had to uh, adjust to the fact that that their mother and father weren't, weren't going to be living together anymore. And uh, we still work at that, but I'm um, delighted at the, the the way the children have become uh, supportive and the, the uh, relationship that we have since then. <laughs> uh, if you have further questions, I'll be glad to uh, talk to, the, to you about those, but I want to spend a few minutes now on the, the second phase, and that is the development of Amos Mennonite Church. My call to pastor in Des Moines turned out to be shorter than I had anticipated, um, but one of the advantages was that the Des Moines Mennonite pastor also was the kind of resource person to the Mennonite students who were in at Iowa State University, 30 miles north. And there was a Mennonite student center that the Iowa Nebraska Mission Board was uh, making possible. And uh, in those early years of 75 to 77, uh, I would spend some time and sometimes the family would go along with me to Bible study held at the student center at Ames on uh, Sunday evenings. At one point, it became uh, uh, obvious that we should have a retreat and talk about forming a congregation. There were a couple of young families who had been part of Des Moines Mennonite who lived close to Ames who were interested. There were some married students at Ames, and then there were the single students in the student center, some of whom were interested in forming a, a local congregation. After a retreat, uh, at the 4-H Center uh, near Ames, we uh, decided to start worshiping together Sunday mornings. One of the things that was important to folks then was that we were a peace church, and so our focus on peace and justice uh, was core to us during those early years. It included uh, workshops, it included uh, being part of uh, peace protests that, that were held by the community, it included continuing to work with the American Friends Service Committee in Des Moines that I had been uh, active in for some years. And in those years, there were several young families. Our own family had moved to, to Ames from Des Moines. And there were several other families. Uh, between us, there were about 13 children, maybe 10 adults, and then some other students. So if everybody was together at one point, we'd have a group of 20 to 30 people. So it was obvious that it was a, a, a big enough group to, to uh, get together. And uh, we got some continuing support, financial support from the uh, Iowa Nebraska Mission Board. And uh, I was a half-time pastor in, in that period of time. I did some study at Iowa State that helped me to get credentialed as a uh, certified marriage and family therapist and also then uh, uh, started working on becoming an approved supervisor. And in the, the period of time, a program, a graduate program had developed on campus in which my presence was needed as a supervisor who was being under supervision. And so the, the many hours that I needed in order to become certified uh, helped me to be present in Ames, uh, although not ministering directly to the congregation. But in the period of time, uh, my work as a marriage and family therapist and my work pastoring and ministering uh, interconnected in many ways. And so uh, uh, that was one factor. Another factor was our work was involved with MCC, many students uh, that came through the University of Iowa State were in agriculture uh, Mennonite students who either had been in MCC work or were going to go into MCC work. And so our working together with MCC was very important at that point. Also, I was related with the uh, mission board, Mennonite Church Mission Board in Elkhart, 
there was a group called uh, Student Young Adult Services. And uh, it was in that group that our work, working with uh, young adults who were in urban settings and students who were in non-Mennonite uh, higher institutions of learning. Uh, the ministry was a whole different focus than uh, people that were going to Heston or Bluffton or, or Goshen. And uh, so we were exploring how to make resources available. And the one thing that the, the students and young adults wanted to know was the whole area of sexuality, homosexuality. And uh, so un until the uh, executives of the mission board in about 1980 um, asked what we were doing, we were in the process of getting a, a, a book together that would be a study guide. Uh, and the, the higher ups at the mission board at that point decided that this was going to be too much of a threat. And so uh, they uh, terminated our project. But in the process, that resource that was in process of developing became a, a good uh, basis for study at Ames Mennonite. And uh, we became known then as a one issue congregation among some people because we were doing a study that made uh, some of the uh, supporting congregations and, and a few of the pastors especially very uncomfortable. So the whole process of ministry during those years not only was a personal issue about my own sexual orientation and relationship, intimate relationships, but then professionally uh, as, a, as a minister of a Mennonite church. My work with the marriage and family therapy program, on the other hand, gave an opportunity. Uh, I was encouraged to take to a, a national conference one year a paper that I had written for a class on uh, um, marriage and family therapy using same-sex couples, same-sex-oriented couples instead of male-female couples. Um, there had never been a presentation done at the National Council on Family Relations on that. And after I did that, I was encouraged to submit that uh, paper for uh, uh, professional publication. And uh, it was accepted with uh, some major editorial changes. But uh, that, that whole arena opened up to me a, an area of, of uh, interest. And the Board of American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, when I, on behalf of our uh, gay uh, little uh, group, support group, uh, the group wanted me to uh, go to the board and ask that, that our professional organization become affirming of GLBT uh, issues and concerns. Uh, we were one of the last of the uh, therapist, therapeutic uh, group of professions, uh, social work, psychology, psychiatry, to, uh, to change and become supportive. But the board at that point was grateful for the opportunity. And so there was affirmation from non-church, uh, non-Mennonite church groups. And so that became a, a, an ongoing resource then and opened up uh, opportunities for me to to work and to uh, to be a, an adjunct professor or adjunct lecturer at Iowa State for uh, a couple of decades. Um, a few minutes yet on the transformation. In the process of, of my work and my searching, uh, working with uh, a deep devotional meditative life and, and interest in Bible and what the Bible has to say, uh, I had a chance to to meet with the executives of the denomination. Uh, one time, we, uh, Irvin Stutzman and I had a, a 24 hour uh, wow. retreat and uh, met Mark um, Bushert. Back growing up, the people with that name were uh, called Bozzards. Um, so I still have trouble uh, pronouncing David's last name uh, accurately. But what became clear was that there was more room for this point of view within the church. And the allies, the, the connecting parents, connecting families group, uh, and other groups were having an impact on what was happening within the denomination. So the, the, the uh, resolution that was presented 
uh, a few years ago at uh, Kansas City on repentance and transformation had a lot of history uh, going, uh, taking place before it was presented. And the, the church's decision by delegates, even though it was a narrow majority, but the, the decision to repent and, and uh, get into a period of transformation was something that really took me by surprise. I did not think that there would be readiness and courage on the part of the denomination for this. So what I would like to do is to uh, present a bit of a challenge. How ready are we as people of God? And I'm amazed at the number of congregate, men and congregations in this community that are so affirming of GLBT concerns. I, I use the term queer. Uh, I'm, I don't like the term homosexuality because it, it's a scientific term that's to be studied. And I'm not a, a specimen to be studied. Um, we're, we're human beings. So I'd prefer to be called fag or queer or, or things that many people are uncomfortable with. But um, we, we are human beings with feelings and reactions. Um, what, what would it take? Is it possible that people who moved back to Goshen and had some kind of history with a college or elsewhere in the area, who then needed to leave because it was discovered or we were outed or they came out as gay. What would it take to uh, my experience of being recredentialed a year ago here across the hall in, in fellowship with the hall was an incredible experience of healing and hope and uh, working together with the delegates of Central District that were here that day. And so I know that, that we have within the denomination a readiness to, to do some good hard work. I don't know how far we can go on this, but what would it take to see what are the gifts that, that we can really use in the church if we join together to look at what does it mean for some of our family members to be gay or queer. I have five grandchildren. Two of them are straight. Uh, some of them live locally. You know, one is in a throuple relationship. She's polyamorous. And they left the state recently because of the increased legal lack of protection for GLBTQ people. Um, I have friends at Mosaic that were informed a few days ago that they, they're they no longer legally, they're, they're criminals if they provide caring services for children, people under 18 years of age. So these folks have to be without any reference to library, literature, to caring people, caring services. What would it take for us to work together to change the laws of the state? Mm -hmm. What would it take for us to get a, a greater feeling and sense of the interaction between sexuality and spirituality, and that they're really united, and that we can't separate sexuality from spirituality? Maybe it's because I'm older that, that it's easier for me to, to talk about that now than 60 years ago when I was only 25 um, and didn't know as much. Maybe it's because as an older person, uh, I'm excused for saying things that I couldn't say 25 years ago. But in our, in our focus on transformation, I'm wondering how deep are we willing to go to find out what, what more the fullness of Christ, the presence of the Spirit, the unity of body and soul, there are various ways of, of uh, languaging this. What would it take to, uh, to enter into that exploration together? So what I've done this morning is to give a little snippets about my personal journey, the, the role of the congregation until we ended, when I informed them that I was going to be moving here to Goshen. Um, 
there were six or eight left in the congregation. By that time, it was older people around my age, not younger people, but a, a wonderful uh, close-knit group. Um, what questions do you have? Um, maybe the snippets have uh, raised a little bit of question. Maybe you've had your own questions. What would you like to to uh, ask to raise? Okay, Leslie. Michael. Yes. What does this bring up within you? Uh, if it's a question I don't want to answer, I'll say so, but there are very few questions I don't want to answer. Uh, I'll start, Keith. Okay. Uh, what's been your experience at Greencroft? Uh, <laughs> how do you, do you feel accepted? And uh, have you had any uncomfortable situations? One of the uh, hesitancies that I had in moving back to Goshen, there were two. One was uh, my experience of Goshen when I was here was about the most recent ones, except for being with my kids and family uh, on visits. Coming to Greencroft, I was amazed that in my economic situation, there was going to be possibility to be there. Um, I'm in Manor 2, which is... Uh, a HUD-supported living situation. Um, there's an advantage to that because I'm used to working with, a lot of my ministry had been with low-income folk. Um, but living full-time uh, and having people know and hear uh, what's next door or across the hallway um, and being there full time, 24 seven, um, I had some uncomfortableness. It, it's less uncomfortable than I had thought. Nice. Um, but um, I have some question about how many people know that I'm queer and what would happen if they knew. Mm -hmm. um, I I tend not to be around the, the what we tend to call the gossip circles. Uh, and I'm sure that, that when I do pass through, if there's any discussion, it, it of course, changes. Because they're, they're good people, uh, very well intended. Um, I've been a bit hesitant in welcoming other queer people to come and live on campus. And so I've checked it out with the previous uh, CEO um, and leadership to see legally and, and what the the, uh, the standards are for people to live there. And we're, we're welcome to, to live as separate people or married, uh, males or females. I'm not sure that, that the campus is ready to openly support us. I just wanted to... Uh have you clarify when you were in the church with at Ames, had you come come out at that point? Were they aware of your sexuality? That that was in stages kind of like with the family. Um, there were times that, that I had a I offered a Bible study that was open to community people, especially uh, students and faculty at, at, on campus. The, the folks, both from the congregation and the area uh, who were in that Bible study, knew that, that I was gay. Some of the people, uh, some of the students knew. Uh, there, were, there were several parts of that. Disclosing that I'm gay meant that they would see Rhoda differently and they would see the kids differently. And so it was not only um, how I'm perceived, but how I, what impact it has on the family. Once the family knew that I not only was supportive of gay people, but was gay, uh, that was an easier situation to deal with. Uh, but um, I'm sorry, I lost track of your question again. Well, I just w wondered whether the church at large uh, knew that you were gay there. In increasingly, yes. Um, we had 
in in the uh, Iowa Nebraska conference we had cluster uh, meetings and that was pastors from the congregations and there were some traditional congregations like Des Moines Mennonite Manson uh, Beamer Nebraska and then there were uh, other congregations where where it was much more similar to us at uh, at Ames uh, one of those was uh, Cedar Cedar Falls uh, and in those settings, increasingly, I was open about my gayness. So it, it, it was over a period of time uh, coming out, uh, kind of testing when would it be too much for, for people to uh, work with? When would it be acceptable? Uh, it wasn't so much, does God accept me? It's, does the community, does the church accept me? I don't know if that answers your question adequately or not. <laughs> By, by 87, I was totally out to everybody. There is a part, but oh, Joanne Smith, um, okay. uh, 1963 graduate of Goshen College, uh, along with Rhoda. Uh, um, there is an apartment in Manor 4 being prepared for a gay couple yes. uh, now. And uh, the um, former wife of one of them lives at Greencroft also. Yes. So it is my former wife. And that, that brings a question of what needs to happen on Greencroft campus? to take seriously people's questions and discomforts and to prepare the way um, when Ron and Charles come, uh, some of us are concerned about what, what kind of reception they will receive because that's very obvious that they're a couple. Um, I don't know that there's been any other male couple that's, that's lived on campus before. <laughs> Abner Hirschberger here. Oh my. <laughs> hi, hi, Keith. Hi, Abner. Hey. Another classmate. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, a number of uh, thoughts here. Um, <laughs> first of all, I always thought that old guys in shorts look kind of ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my the question <laughs> I have. I think that you might be able to uh, put a perspective to uh, In the arts, I just found that there are many uh, persons who are gay and um, some of the, the, the best. And, and, and I, just, I tried to figure this thing out. I think it had to do with sensitivity. I, I really think that's probably what um, it comes down to. Yeah. And um, I, one of the, um, the questions then, have you ever noticed that uh, so many uh, of persons in the arts uh, are gay and what... If, if it's true, what would you, how would you characterize that, um, that combination of um, person and, and uh, the arts? I really thank you for that question, Abner. Um, I remember being in Amsterdam and going to the Van Gogh Museum. And um, <laughs> being in tears because I had a, a, a deep sense of what was going on in his ang agony and anguish as he was going about that tremendous art work. I felt the same in, in some of the uh, musical spheres as well. Um, we have to be sensitive to what's going on around us. 
uh, for survival. Uh, and if we didn't have that kind of access to the vibes, uh, we, we wouldn't exist. We know that in, in our bones. Uh, that kind of sensitivity has a way of letting in the deeper beauty being sensitive at a deeper level. This is my take at this point. Um, I've read read quite a few different uh, perspectives on that, and I, I find some resonance with that. That doesn't mean that every musician and every artist, of course, is queer, but uh, there, there are a lot of them that are. I remember talking with Vance George at one point. Vance was very... Um, effusive about his honoring of Mary Oyer. Um, and Vance became a well-loved musician in, at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Um, and after an Easter service, that I went there with him uh, with a couple of other friends and saw how he was being re regarded and responded by congregants uh, as we entered that building at that point. I realized that there, there's some people that have made a big impact on a deep level to our culture who, who are queer, whether they were recognized that way at the time or not. And the, the best that I can do is to say that there's some kind of sensitivity. Now, I've done some studying in the last 15, 20 years on the journey of the soul. And uh, a lot of this had to do with studying spiritual science and uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner and others. Um, Casey, Edgar Casey, um, and am aware that in the journey of the soul, um, I, I became aware then that, that I came into this lifetime with an awareness that I had a mission, and that mission included uh, the kinds of issues, deeper issues that I would deal with. And so there's, there seems to me to be, from that perspective, what, what helped me in, in accepting that perspective was that I came in with a, a sense of calling to be aware of, of what's going on with a broader mission than just my own survival. And it's that kind of sensitivity that seems to come through in the poetry, the, the art, including music and the various uh, art media. Any response to that or not? Absolutely. Catherine Ashelman, class of 54. Oh my goodness, Catherine. <laughs> I'm not sure that I have the right words to ask what I right. am interested in. But I'm I'm wondering about the origin of this. Do you call it a condition? Uh, is it something then that is passed on in future generations? Or, you know, where does it all come from? <laughs> I, I don't know that there's any definitive answer to that yet. It's been a question raised. Um, and it used to be, uh, why in the world has God permitted this affliction uh, to... Uh, what special purpose has God had in mind to create some of us in that special image of God? Um, the question used to be, is it nurture or nature? That may be behind some of the question that you're raising. Um, and at this point, we are quite aware, I think most of science will tell us that it's, it's not nurture. It certainly wasn't my dad's fault. Yeah. Um, excuse me. That, that still brings up <laughs> uh, some deep emotion, of course. But um, uh, for some time, uh, fathers had, had that affliction that they had to, to deal with. Why are only two of my five grandkids straight? They're great people. Um, and uh, had breakfast at 
at Olympia Kitchen yesterday morning with Jonathan and Michael, and um, we had a wonderful time. I'm, I'm delighted he is who he is. Uh, and I'm delighted that we have capacity to to be able to connect on, on a deep level uh, that, that isn't uh, sexually normative or identity normative. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great question. I'm in the process of, of finding out the answers. There's been a lot written about it. We had a, uh, th there was a gay spirituality uh, conference uh, in uh, up the Hudson in 2004. And some of us were Christians, some were uh, from various spiritual uh, backgrounds. And uh, part of the question was, what what is it that we have to offer? It wasn't so much the question of, uh, of uh, why are we who we are, but what do we have to offer? So that relates a bit to to what Abner was bringing up also. But thanks, Catherine. Anne Kriegel Hirschberger, um, Abner's wife, class of 58 at Goshen College, yes. nursing faculty and nurse at the Goshen College. With Vance George. Yes. What? With Vance George. Well, he was older than I was, <laughs> four years older. Yeah, right. Um, um, Lynn Garber was around at the time. Right. Yes. If you had your druthers, how would you design an ideal society to be accepting and to uh, support people of all stripes, including the sexually um, marginalized and so on? Um, <laughs> You could apply that either to the church society or to general society. But I, I was wondering if you could have your way in getting this more acceptable and understood, what would you suggest? That, that is a simple question, isn't it? Um, in short, get over ourselves. Well, sure. The less I know, the better I am. The more, the more I have to know, the more I need to be in control, and the more rigid I become, um, and the more I have to have answers. I'm so excited these days. I'm, I'm part of an online group the last several years. It's called the Integral Christian Network. And there is work at um, seeing ourselves as part of the whole integral in that sense. It's all united, related. And it's mystical. It's not so much what we know and setting up rules, but it's what what is to be revealed? How is spirit world um, opening up to us new awarenesses, new possibilities? The synchronicities that I'm experiencing in life are phenomenal. Um, and the more open I am, the more I recognize whether it be talking, now you'll know how crazy I am, talking to, to the uh, fowl uh, around the pond on campus um, and, and finding that there's a level of, of communication. I mean, why did, did one of the deer in the park near my house in, in Ames pay special attention to me one day as I was walking through the park and we could look at each other eye to eye for some time in, in peace? There's a sense in which the less we have to know, the less we have to be in charge, the more open we are to how the spirit is moving. Um, that's a beginning point, maybe. Uh, the other is that there has to be a lot of healing because most of us are broken and, and um, pained at some deep level in some way. And, and I think that a lot of our lives are spent in uh, in trying to find safety and trying to find ways to to be present with without being um, without ha having those wounds delimit us. The alternative is learning from our wounds. The wounded healer by Henry Nouwen years ago became a, a very important uh, asset to me and still is. Some ideas off the cuff. 
Sure. Uh, Keith, I'm I'm John Letterock. I, you know, I was uh, I guess the class of '57. I stayed out for several years after I started. But Keith, I I want to say that you know we are part of a holiness movement. That there are many times in my lifetime in the ministry that the church is divided over things. But I'm just grateful that you had the strength to stay with the church, even though the church didn't want you at times. And I just express my appreciation that that of all the, the people that have left and are gone and not part of it, you have had the tenacity to stay with us. And, and your witness today is an example of how that uh, the church, parts of the church at least, uh, is catching up, and and I'm grateful for that because I'm also part of the of the catching up community. Oh. But you know, this is not the only generation that will have a problem like this. Oh. There's future generations will have new things that yeah. they'll have to deal with. Yes, gotcha. but I I thank you that in your journey that you had the tenacity and the hope to stay with us. And so that's a, a word of thanks to you. Thank you, John. Now, the thing that was interesting to me was when I, I took a sojourn among the pagans and the radical fairies and, and learned to, uh, to understand the queer god and be in rituals where the queer god was honored. There were so many other men who uh, had been also very badly treated by the church. And so to come out as a Christian and come out as a minister um, <laughs> was uh, equally challenging. But there was something inside me that couldn't do otherwise. And that was the case with the church. Mm -hmm. That deep sense of call, you know, I was asked the question often. The other thing is there were always resistant, resilient people in the, in the church, some queer and others not, who, uh, who were who walked with us, um, people like Ed Stolzfus, uh, who was on the listening committee in the early 90s when the listening committee of the denomination failed to accept recommendations that were submitted. Um, and they gave their lives and, and a lot of respect in the church were, were badly treated when, when they were ignored and denied. So there were others along the way that uh, straight, gay, uh, that were part of a, a broader group of witnesses. And those, and some of you have been part of, of that group as well. Thank God. Well, Keith, we're glad you're here. And as the sign says, we hope it's for the best of your life. <laughs> And so join me in thanking Keith for presenting to us. Uh, next week, we hope Shannon Martin will be well enough to come and uh, speak to us. I We're forgot, adjourned. I forgot to mention that there were a couple of books. Roberta Showalter Kreider, who had been here and was a neighbor of, of mine always for some years. Uh, one of her ministries was to edit some books uh, about our journeys. And uh, I have stories in each of these. Uh, that's another part of journey of people who are uh, respecting us. Sorry to be <laughs> bringing that up. Thank you all. Yeah, th thank you.